Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. It's a question and answer show. Uh, spring has sprung. The daffodils, at least in my neck of the woods, are in bloom. Uh, the insects are starting to come out. The growing season has arrived. Uh, so the gardening questions have also started to pour in. And you know I'm not doing this by myself. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Not only are the good things coming out, I was down in St. Louis area this weekend, and all the calorie pear along the interstate's blooming, and the honeysuckle's starting to, to bud out. So mm -hmm. you can go find that stuff now and go kill it. So I just did a little... Uh, a hike in the woods the other day and i did notice the honeysuckle in the macomb area the leaf buds have started to swell they're popping open um and then as i was i was looking for willows that's that's was my goal of the whole thing i was looking for willows for a a, a different master gardener event uh that we have coming up they needed willows for their event and couldn't find any but i found plenty of honeysuckle and then as i'm walking around i find what I didn't realize was deep in the woods was calorie pear, um, which they have smooth bark. And I noticed their flower buds were starting to swell and start to burst open. And so it's that I would say flag them if you don't have the opportunity to chop them down right now and, and, and get them uh, sometime this year. Yes. But on the, on the prettier side stuff, yeah, our, in our yard, we've got a uh, bluebells are coming up and starting to bloom. Um, we've got one of the parks in Jacksonville is covered in spring beauties right now. Those start opening up this weekend. So it's definitely starting to get pretty outside. Oh, yeah. yeah I am sad because at our, our prettiest portion along our house is uh, we have tulips, we have iris, we have daffodils, lamb's ear. We have all kinds of things along there and a lot of interesting spring bloomers. When we we got like a two inches of rain within 20 minutes, I think uh, a few days ago or last week, uh, we had water in our basement in a place where we've never had water before. And my background being in landscape architecture, I should have figured this out myself, but I uh, we had a, a contractor who works with tiles come over and he pointed to the very obvious settling that has happened in that particular spot and a crack in the foundation. So that means I have to lift all of my bulbs out of the ground. I got to move everything and we're gonna have to dig that out. So I'm very sad that I'm gonna miss out on a lot of spring blooms that we usually have. And so, um, but they will be relocated for next year. Put them in pots. Maybe you can get them to bloom. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's a lot of iris and a lot of <laughs> tulip and a lot of yeah. daffodil. Go get a, a pallet of pots and potting mix. and. <laughs> I might just lift the entire section out and then just replace all that soil once they're done digging there. So, um, yeah, so that's so everyone, if you're listening, go check around the foundation of your home, see where it might have settled, <laughs> find cracks and, and remedy the situation before you are too are swimming in your own house. Well, Ken, we have a lot of questions to get through today. Uh, uh, as with before, these are questions from living, breathing human beings that have asked us these things. Um, so we are answering them on air today. And if you do have uh, questions, our emails are below in the show notes or the video description, however you're watching or listening to us. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. We can answer them via email or on air as, as we are right now. So, uh, Ken, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off with our first question this week, please. All right. Our first question is how many seeds per cell do you recommend for vegetable plants to get seed starts? We could probably expand that to flowers too. Yes. Yeah. And I, I would say when it comes to seeding individual cells, now a lot of times there's different I guess we'll start with equipment because equipment can vary depending upon what you have access to or what you purchased. Um, but for the most part, we're going to have individual little cells. Usually they come in six packs. So there's six cells in a pack. Some people might be using little pots. Some people could be using larger pots. And so it, it does vary. I think the, the best recommendation that we could give is to read that seed packet because it's going to tell you how many seeds, but that seed packet is typically assuming you have a cell pack. So you have 
a pack of six cells, which you would fill with potting mix, and you would then seed that. Um, and so the seed packet would say, I, I, I don't know about you, Ken, but for the most part, kind of depends on how much the seed costs. If it's really expensive, um, I might do one seed per cell and I might do as, as many cells as I can fill. If the seed is cheap, I might do two or three seeds per cell and just thin them out once I see who germinates. What What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. Uh, larger seeds, I usually only do one, maybe two. Um, and it depends on how many seeds I have, how many plants I want. If I only want a handful of plants, I've got a whole bunch of seed. I'll probably seed a little heavier and then thin out uh, for my best ones. Uh, and the yeah, and the smaller seeds sometimes it's just it's almost impossible to get one seed. Yes, uh, if you're doing like you know snapdragons or poppies or or things like that, they're just ridiculously small. You just you know get a few on your finger, poke them in there, and hope for the best mm -hmm. um, type thing. Yeah, yeah. And I would say, and also some seed packets will give you germination percentage. So if you, you know if you've got a a plant you're trying to grow that doesn't have very good germination, um, I would personally I usually do a, a, probably a little extra, maybe two or three in there. So I know I've got, I'm going to have hopefully have something in each cell, so I don't end up with with blank cells uh, and stuff. So I would say some some companies are better than others on putting that germination percentage on there, but that's something you can look for as well. If it's a you know ninety five percent germination, you could probably get away with one or two per cell. If it's something like sixty percent. And I would be doing multiple just so I don't have empty space. Yes. And I, I just thought of it right now, but I do have a, a, an example of a six cell cell pack. And so these would be something that you would then put in a larger flat and you could fill out a whole flat. Um, and these are a bit smaller. And so you can fit more in a flat. Um, there's some flats where you have like 75, 120, you know, it just kind of depends on the size of this this cell right here but um i think for the most part most seed packets are they're assuming you're planting into something like this uh, sometimes they do say pots though like so round circular pots yeah i think onions is one um redama that you know they talk about the cells or just basically get a flat fill it with your potting mix and mm -hmm. kind of broadcast it and then you can tease out the individual uh, plants when you want to transplant yeah, I, I know a lot of the flowering plants also, they use like a single row in a flat. I don't know the name of that actual flat, but you just kind of seed it in a row and you you thin it out. I, I've done that with arugula before, actually. Um, and, and actually, so I seeded like a, a whole row of arugula in this flat. And then I just picked it up and I put it in the garden and I just made my rows of arugula. It worked really well. Then the flea beetles found them. Um, and because... <laughs> flea beetles and arugula they go hand in hand uh, but row cover if I was on the ball would have would have prevented would have prevented all that damage that I experienced still you can eat it still peppery still good that's just something we've mentioned thinning a couple of times I'd say if you're if you are doing multiple seeds per cell make sure you go through and thin because uh, if you get them too thick in there they start competing and they get leggy and they don't look uh, particularly good this this weekend I thinned out our snapdragons which I should have done probably two or three weeks ago. So I've got some pretty leggy plants. Um, you can tell which ones germinated first. They they look a little bit better than some of the the newer ones. But um, daughter was helping, and uh, you can tell which ones she seeded, uh -huh. <laughs> which ones I did. Some of them were a forest, and some some not so much. So just make sure you go through and thin, so you don't end up with leggy plants that are having to compete with others uh, for that nutrients and, and, and light. I would say my weapon of choice for that is a little fingernail scissors that um, I, I use to go in and kind of meander my way through the little uh, seedlings I have used. I've just tried to pluck out the seedlings before to thin them, and I wind up destroying <laughs> the ones I want to <laughs> save. So, um, yeah, I would I would I use little fingernail scissors to go in and um, thin things out. It's much safer for the ones that I want to survive. Yes, and as painful as it is sometimes to kill perfectly good plants, everybody will be happier if you do. That's right, that's right. Well, Ken, speaking of seed starting, um, let's say we got the seeds going in the flats. Do we need any special light for this when we're doing it inside? 
I'd say yeah, you're probably going to need some supplemental lighting. And a lot of people try to start seeds and, and windows. Uh, if you're going to be doing that, your south facing exposure is going to be best, but you're still probably not going to get enough light uh, this time of year. The sun uh, isn't as intense as it is uh, in the summer stuff coming through windows. It's, you're probably not going to get enough light. Uh, and you're going to have to constantly be rotating those pots because those plants are going to lean towards it. So if you want straight plants, you're going to have to do a quarter turn every few days probably to keep them straight but i would probably go with some kind of supplemental lighting uh fluorescent lighting uh is what you're going to be i don't even know if you can buy incandescent lights anymore um yeah, but when you, go, you can yeah, yeah you don't use those because they give off so much heat um and they're not terribly efficient at producing light and they kind of burn up your plants using those because you have to have those lights fairly close to those ceilings to get enough light on them that's going to be fluorescent lights you can just get shop lights um that's good enough and keep those probably about three, four inches above the, your seedlings. Um, so you're getting enough light to them. You can get LED lights. Um, there's all kinds of stuff out there, but fluorescent shop light or one of the spiral ones, if you've got a small one, mm -hmm. uh, small area you're, you're trying to, small area you're trying to illuminate, uh, you can get probably away with one of the spiral ones if you get it uh, relatively close. Yeah. I, in, in my seed starting setup, I have, I have the fluorescents, I have LEDs, and I don't really notice, I have the white LEDs and I have the blue and red LEDs. I don't really notice much difference. Actually with the, maybe with the blue and reds, um, some of my house plants that are under them, they're flowering. <laughs> they have not stopped flowering all winter. And so the light waves that they're being exposed to is probably just triggering flowering on them. Um, and so it, it, it's kind of unfortunate because I think it's using up a lot of the plant's energy because the leaves are getting smaller and smaller <laughs> and smaller and they still keep flowering. So we really, I am really looking forward to getting them back outside into the sunlight um, into kind of that more natural uh, light effect. And so I, I have not really noticed a difference in terms of LED and uh, my my shop lights that I, I also have rigged up. So um, either are, are good options for people. So we've got some blue and red uh, that we use for seed starting for a few years and for me anyway, it seems like the tomatoes didn't do quite as well under the red and, and blue ones that can't turn your room pink yep uh, when you're using it so we've got ours that we just use those for for all of our citrus and whatnot that we're overwintering um yeah those have all bloomed and smelled amazing for a couple of weeks there but that, that's my experience maybe i was doing something else wrong uh, and i will say if you are using those if you do get one of the red and primarily red and blue once turns mm -hmm. everything pink uh, that does mess with your eyesight um, for a little bit if you've got them in room everything looks green uh, when you go in. and they do yeah. have they do sell, sell glasses that you can get it mm -hmm. doesn't affect your your vision as much because when we were doing it um we had a spare bedroom and the kids would want to go in and look at stuff and we made them wear the <laughs> the sunglasses just their eyes don't get all messed up temporarily yeah well, yeah, I think ours came with those glasses and when you put them on, like all of a sudden I see, oh, I have like aphids and scale all over my plant. I didn't see that with the blue and mm. red light on there. So uh, those, I, I think that's one of the reasons why they include those glasses because because of the, the spectrum of light being bounced off that plant, we can't see some pests that might also be present. And so again, another benefit to them. All right, so moving on to putting stuff outside here. Uh, are there any fruits or vegetables that you should not plant close to each other? Uh, we're in the place of something else that was last that was grown somewhere last season. It's a little bit of their companion planting and rotation. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say in terms of that, the hardest one that I, I have to follow that rotation rule of every three to four years where you don't want to have that family of plants in that that location is nightshade. Nightshade is the Solanaceae, the, the family of tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplant. I mean, everything that I enjoy to grow, I, I have to keep them rotated in a three to four year time period. And so in my small yard with limited full sun uh, opportunity, I usually have to switch from in-ground gardening to container gardening with my with my nightshade uh, family plants. And so um, this year, I think we're going to be actually moving a lot of our tomatoes and peppers that we did grow in there. We're going to put them back into the pots 
and we're doing, we're not doing, we we're going to do a little bit of corn um, and we're going to do some greens and some sunflowers. I believe that is the plan for this year. So, so yeah, I would say for me, the biggest problem is nightshade. And then Ken also, the, this family breaks me all the time, cucurbits and the pests and the disease that seems to follow the cucurbits around the garden. Um, I give up growing things like pumpkins and stuff uh, for a few years at a time, just, just because of, I don't have enough sunlight and I don't have enough space. And so yeah, Ken, did, any other thoughts on, on the plant rotation? Yeah, it's definitely one of those that's easier said than done uh, a lot of times with, with yards, uh, just because you don't have limited growing space. Uh, so yeah, so for us this year, I think, I don't think we're growing any tomatoes this year. Um, we rotate around, but, you know, we've just, in, we've got a couple of good places for growing them and, and things have just built up and admittedly we're kind of over tomatoes uh, a little bit. So <laughs> we're going to yeah. take the year off uh, for those and that'll hopefully help get some of that, some of those uh, foliar diseases out of the, out of our garden. Uh, and yeah, cucurbits are, those are hard. I think that's almost one of those where you got to just take a year off with the squash bugs and, um, and things like that, or you're going to have to go out and, and constantly scout and probably mm -hmm. spray to manage those. Yeah. Well, I mean, we grew a beautiful pumpkin last year, disease free, pest free, but then we saw a squash vine borer move in. I was able to go in and salvage the vine, got rid of the, the larva tunneling into the stem, mounded compost up against the base of that stem. It rerouted, pumpkin vine recovered from that. And it did okay, but I I just know that I didn't get all the squash fine borer. Uh, there there was a few that made it past me, and they're um, what's their life cycle like? Ken, aren't they pupating in the soil right now, yeah, waiting to come out and waiting for me to plant more pumpkins? They're waiting for you. Yes. Uh, so one thing you could do is go in and, and till that area up in hopes that you would get those pupa. Same thing with like tomato, tobacco, hornworm. They'll pupate in the soil and overwinter in the soil. Um, so that's one time where you know, we don't want to till too much in our gardens, but that, that is one time where tilling could help. If you have, if you're going to grow those same crops, um, tilling that area up could help. Uh, with things like that, that the fly, you can get out of your immediate yard, but if your neighbors have them and you're just going to fly on over, <laughs> fly over the fence and come visit you. Yep. I'm going to kill all the Japanese beetle grubs in my yard. Well, if my neighbors don't, I'm still going to get the adults as, yeah, exactly. as frequently. Yep. All right, Ken, this is a question that it comes up all the time when I do a gardening program. How should plants be planted in Illinois? Should the rows run north to south or should they run east to west? Uh, I would say it, it probably doesn't make that big of a difference. Uh, the big thing is if you're going to be growing taller stuff, you're growing sweet corn, tomatoes, things like that, you probably want to put that to the north of everything so it doesn't shade uh, other plants out or give enough room so they're not casting shadows uh, on your other plants. Um, unless if you're growing lettuce or something like that, you're probably not going to have those out at the same time, unless mm -hmm. it's in the fall. Some of those leafy greens could probably take a little more shade uh, and it may, it could help them, you know, last a little bit longer if they're getting shaded uh, a little bit, cool them off. But for the most part, tall stuff to the north uh, so it doesn't shade out. And a lot of it's going to depend on how your garden. Your gardening space area is how big it is where how it's oriented and stuff i would say don't get hung up on east west north south for rows uh, it's probably going to make a minimal difference as to what you're yeah. doing I, yeah as, as you said ken I, I would say your your biggest limitation is that your shading effect and maybe how your how an individual's garden is set up and you know we i can barely comment on my own garden let alone uh listeners your garden so um if the the shading of a tall sweet corn crop is going to uh, limit the rotation potential, like in the question we just answered, then maybe that then maybe you know that north south orientation could be a bit more ideal. It, but again, that's up to your your individual garden. And so, uh, just so long as we can continue that rotation process um, and rotating the taller stuff around isn't going to affect the 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 shading out of other crops so uh, but i think they have actually done a little bit of research on this north south east west row orientation and they found it doesn't matter 
Now, say in my own garden, I've got stuff going east, west, and north, south at the same mm -hmm. time. It just depends on you know, if I've got a section going running north, south, um, that may be leave a may not have enough room to get another thing north, south. So I'll go east, west. So it's just it's just kind of a patchwork in my garden. Yeah. All right. Uh, so moving from in the ground to pots. So how do we prepare soil and pots for the next year? Mm. Um, how much of a cheapskate are you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say the best thing we can do for our plants and pots is to give them as much soil volume as possible. And that is the ideal thing. Uh, so let's do as I say, not as I do. Sometimes I have the, the big container when I'm going to put my tomato in and I realize I don't have enough potting soil to fill this thing. And so I will put a couple bricks or something in the bottom there to try to fill up some volume or some space. And so that's how I'll try to accommodate some of that volume. But let's say I have stuff left over from last year. Um, it depends what I grew in that container last year. Um, for the most part, I am rotating flowering plants with vegetables. And so I want to make sure that I'm not rotating in something like, uh, let's say, flowering tobacco, which is an ornamental annual, something that you can buy as a bedding plant that I would put in a container. I want to make sure that I'm not also next this year going to be planting a tomato in there because same thing with rotation. They're both in the nightshade family. Um, they both share uh, disease relationships. And so um, there's, just, there's a lot of thought to go into this. And there's a lot of memory and note taking that's required to remember, what did I plant in this pot last year? And I, if you can keep track of that stuff without writing it down, good job. Um, or, or taking photographs also really do help. Um, that's when a lot of those like plant social media apps, I think that are out there, um, they're useful because then you can scroll back last year and whatever photos you shared and you can be like oh that this is what i did and so it's a way to document what you've done um so i try not to reuse too much potting soil a lot of it will go out into the compost pile or it'll, it'll go into the uh, garden but if i do reuse potting soil i am trying to be aware of what grew in that pot last year yeah are petunias nightshade too yes they sorry are. don't don't follow your petunias with tomatoes mm -hmm. or any of that I would say if you're if you're reusing it too, it's, it's like most potting soils nowadays, or at least that I see, have a slow release fertilizer in there, uh, but that usually only lasts for what two three months. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna if you are reusing it, you're probably gonna have to fertilize some, because typically our potting soils are not very don't have a lot of nutrients in them in the the media itself. You're gonna be relying on fertilizer for that. So making sure you're if you are reusing, you're gonna want to fertilize to. Make sure you've got enough nutrition in there for your plants or do your vegetables and follow up with flowers where you're not harvesting, you're not trying to get a harvest off those plants. Um, so it's not quite as important, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Others may feel well, differently. Well, and the annual bedding flowering plants, their life cycle, they have to flower as much as possible. And that's what the plant breeders have done to them. And they they're their goal is to flower, 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 set seed, and then they die. Their, their life cycle is one year. And so that's why a lot of our pretty container plantings are annuals, um, just because the flower show matches their life cycle. And, and so that that's how that relates. And maybe can it's also a good point right here to, to mention, what do we put into pots? Because another question I often get to is like, can I just dig up soil from my garden and throw it in the pot? And I, we would often say no. Um, that's because we need to facilitate really good drainage. So we use an artificial mixture. And we call it soil, but it's not really soil. It, we, the best term for this is going to be a, a potting media or a, a, a soil media, artificial matrix. Uh, yeah. Soilless mix. Soilless mix. Yeah, there, there's a lot of words for it, but just it it is not soil. It is artificial. And then the reason why we want good drainage, why we want drainage holes in a pot and why we want good draining artificial soilless mix is because if we think about the volume of soil that we have in the ground, like we have our, our in-ground gardens and landscapes, that water, there's so much soil that that water can very easily move away from plant roots. It easily drains away due to gravity and all the other 
forces of nature there that, that pull water away from plant roots. In a pot, that doesn't happen if we're using garden soil, stuff out of the ground. And so we need an artificial media that will facilitate pulling that water away from roots so that they don't rot. And um, I would also say that the artificial mix is much more lightweight, which makes it much easier for me to move these pots around the yard and the patio. So win-win um, for the back. Yeah, and that that your garden soil, your, if you're digging it from your yard, it's going to have weed seeds in there. Mm -hmm. It's going to have weed seeds in there, I'm going to say possibly, but it will have weed seeds in there. It definitely uh, that, will. <laughs> that you're going to be dealing with. There could be pathogens in there. That, that may pop up and cause issues. There could be insects. So there's going to be all kinds of other critters and, and things in there that could potentially cause problems for you on top of not draining well uh, and stuff. So your your potting mix is typically going to be like a, a sphagnum peat moss um, kind of milled up. Uh, a lot of times you'll see more and more you're seeing kind of shredded bark compost mm -hmm. uh, in there, perlite, which is going to be the white stuff. Uh, it's kind of like a volcanic rock that's been popped. Uh, vermiculite, which is the gold uh, stuff in there, or, or some of the more commonly used materials in there. And again, those, yeah, those are light. They'll retain some moisture, but they still allow that drainage. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about that stuff. And that's that should be, um, oh, sterile is the right term. There shouldn't be any weed seeds in there. There shouldn't be any pathogens. That's um, usually heat treated to kind of get rid of anything that may be in there. Yeah. Or there'd be that, minimum weeds and stuff. Uh, that is a great question that I have always had, Ken. So when I was brought up in the greenhouse world, we never sterilized potting mix. We pasteurized it. But I hear all the time um, different scientists, researchers um, talking about sterile potting mix. So I don't know if the stuff we buy at the store is that that can't be sterile. It's got to be more of a pasteurization where they get that, that right, they treat. steam it, they heat mm -hmm. treat it to a certain temperature, not to, not to eliminate everything, but to eliminate probably the worst offenders, um, disease and, and weed seeds. And so I, I can't imagine we would be putting sterile stuff in the pot, but I don't, I don't know because a lot of people describe it as sterile. So that's a question that I have. That could be one of those terms that mean different things that we conflate, like cultivar variety. That's true. Yes, there is <laughs> a difference there. We, we, we some yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ken, is there, should we be testing our container soils, do you think? Is there a reason to do that? Uh, I guess you could. Uh, personally, I I wouldn't. I Most of them are coming with that. If it's, you're getting a it new, it's, it should have. Well, it shouldn't, shouldn't. If it's saying it's got the, the soil release, it's going to feed for three months. It's got that soil release fertilizer on there. You, you probably don't need to. And, and if we're doing like we should and reusing it or not reusing it and replacing every year, uh, it shouldn't be an issue. If you are going to reuse it, you could soil test, but I would, I would say just assume you're probably going to have to do some some fertilization. Yeah. Um, do like a liquid or you can, you can buy those, that soil release. Um, Osmocote would be an example of that. That you could just put in there yourself and the, and read the label will tell you how much you need to put in there for the volume mm -hmm. of your pot and stuff and soil testing for containers soil it costs money and it might even out to just go and buy a new bag of potting soil so uh i think the only may, may well not only but most backyard growers don't necessarily have an interest in testing potting mix but if you maybe grow commercially that could be an instance where you would want to test and reuse. Like I mentioned before, when I was studying at the uh, Carbondale, SIUC Carbondale Greenhouse, um, we reused potting mix, which means we had to pasteurize it. We had to um, uh, recycle it. A lot of commercial growers, whether you're ornamentals or edible crops, um, you're probably going to want to save money by reusing potting mix. And that's an instance where, yeah, you would test your soilless media. And um, we'll leave a link in the video description. Um, our new soils website, it does have a page about testing soilless media. Um, that was written by our local foods educators at Grant. And so we'll leave a link to that if folks are interested in learning more about this topic.
Well, that was a lot of great information about uh, getting those seeds up and running, whether it's in the basement or it's in the back patio, in a container or in the ground, getting that garden ready for this year. The Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by Ken Johnson. And a special thanks to Ken for hanging out this week and answering your uh, gardening questions. Thank you very much, Ken. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for hanging out. and uh, Let me know if I need to come up with my shovel and start digging plants. It's going to be a deep hole <laughs> <laughs> where they're going to fix the foundation there. Yes. And uh, are we going to do this again next week? Oh, right. oh, we will do a garden bite next week. Um, so we uh, we will have Nick Filman on uh, doing a garden bite for next week. And so uh, after that, it's if you have more questions, folks, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. And we are happy to answer them, as always, on email or, or on air. Uh, you just, just let us know. And uh, that's what we're here for. Uh, listeners, thanks for doing what you do best. And that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. Thank you.